Hey, how's it going, everyone? We're just going to give it another minute or two, let everyone else hop in, and we should be good to go. Hey there, everyone who joined. We're just going to give it another minute. Just let some last minute people hop on and we should be good to start. All right, awesome. So let's get right into this. Um, just want to give a quick introduction to myself. My name is Levi Kapilevich. I'm the business development manager for Nectar Labs. We're a software firm that helps with a portion of the NIST 800 171. Um, today, we're going to be talking a little bit about the steps you should be taking right now to start preparing for the new cybersecurity maturity model certification, or the CMMC as it's often known. Uh, we have an amazing group of panelists today, uh, joined by naturally Regan Edens, who is the CTO for DTC Global. He also serves as a volunteer for the CMMCAB, working for the Standards Committee. Um, on top of that, we also have Nick Delena. He's the principal over at DGC. They're an auditing firm that's been doing a lot of work in the cyberspace, helping companies with their original assessments and building out that documentation for the NIST 800-171. We have Patrick Colantonio, who's director of sales for Nectar Labs. And you know, he's a good friend of mine, so looking forward to hearing what he has to say. And closing it up, we have Ryan Heidorn, who with Steelroot. And Steelroot is a national MSSP that does a lot of work with small, medium-sized contractors, helping them, you know, walk through and build out their NIST 800 171 programs and naturally prepare for CMMC as well. So I want to quickly say there's a lot of amazing webinars out there that talk about, you know, what exactly CMMC is. They break down the levels and they talk about what you, you should be aware of. That's really not the point of this webinar. We want to talk a little bit more specifics. You know, what is CMMC and what can you be doing right now to actually begin getting ready so that once the audited audits actually begin occurring, you can immediately go ahead and, you know, hopefully pass and get a good certification. I'm going to hand it over to Regan just to talk a little bit more about the AV side of things and let you know a little more. Okay, thanks, uh, Levi. Well, so I uh, appreciate uh, uh, much, much deeply appreciate you, uh, Nectar Labs, and uh, have really been beginning in the fight a uh, long, long time. And our uh, relationship over the last year and a half, um, it's it's awesome to be. Uh, really seeing the breakthrough that we have when we transition from DFARS into CMMC. I'm fortunate enough to be uh, a director on the board of directors and, of course, the chairman of the standards committee and with and, and, uh, vice chair of the uh, the training committee. And, and just, just to let everyone know, those principal responsibilities really focus on bringing cons um, clarity, consumability, and consistency to the standard and so that uh, one of the major challenges that we have and, and that we are taking headlong 
is the ability to ensure that assessors from uh, company to company are very consistent in how they interpret the standard and how they apply the standards. And as you might imagine, that, that that's a tremendous challenge. Um, so the just an update about the um, CMMC um, um, accreditation body. You know, we we uh, it's been it's been a it's been one of I I I spent my entire career doing hard hard things, and this is this is as hard as it gets. I I'm not I'm I'm not shy about the difficulties and the challenges that are before us, and we we've been um we have taken a, the volunteers on the board as the board of directors have, have really um uh, leaned heavily into those challenges to try and meet meet the expectations of the div and and really stand in the gap between the um uh, defense industrial base and the dod to try to, to make sure that the standard is um feasible that it is reasonable that it meets the national security standard and that the the companies out there that have struggled underneath DFAR 7012, um, and that we again bring clarity to the standard so that they understand what they need to do. At the end of the day, the the the, the challenge here is is to give you the answers to the test. Um, you know, no one wants to play gotcha. Everyone wants the companies out there who are um, who are struggling to figure out what to do, what to, uh, what to do now, and what to do next know um uh, have a sense of direction and distance on on where the finish line is and what right really looks like so that's um you know my in industry working group um has been working since um, probably march i think um about four thousand hours um and that's probably conservative actually on on helping refine the assessment guide with uh, working with the dod uh pmo to help refine the assessment guide to bring clarity and consistency to the standard. Now, um, it's not not quite ready yet. Uh, we are uh, working to uh, reconcile um, some of the work that we've done with the, the uh, current version, which no one has seen yet, of the uh, assessment guide. And in order again to bring to bring clarity to that that standard. And I, I gotta, you know, um, uh, Stacy and um, and Buddy Dees and John Troy uh, with the PMO team have done an excellent job. Um, and um, this week, as a matter of fact, we kicked off the industry uh, working group for the assessment guide to reconcile those differences. And we are genuinely appreciative of their ability to uh, work with us uh, to bring sort of an industry perspective um, uh, uh, to uh, sort of to operationalize uh, the uh, the original assessment guide. So one of the things that we um, one of the things that, that I really want people to focus in on is 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 a simple truth, which is. I know CMMC has the buzz. I I get that, but it is not important right now. What is important right now is that you focus on DFAR 7012. There are 110 controls, and in I you know I I've been doing this for the last four years of my life. I from you know very very large uh, uh, multi-billion dollar conglomerates all the way down to you know machine shops in in uh, the F35 ecosystem there in Fort Worth, right? And, I, and we have that wide spectrum. And the reason we do that is because it, it, make, it keeps it real, right? I understand the challenges at large enterprise. I, I trust me, I totally understand the challenges at, at, the, at the small machine shops and small businesses. Both of them matter because we do not get anywhere until both of those uh, challenges have been met. So the 110 controls um, represent about 92% of the core of the core requirements for CMMC, there are 20 additional controls um, or practices rather than CMMC. However, uh, right now those are distraction. What you really need to focus on is getting it right. There is a very tall standard, and that is 100% conformity on the day um, uh, uh, judgment day when when certification comes. Right. So you also need to be um, as it stands right now, 100% compliant with your POAM. All right, um, and I don't. I, I really uh, just we we have made our, our recommendation, but uh, I I don't believe I believe that the DoD policy is going to stand. That you will have to have 100% 100% um, uh, uh, completion of the POAM by uh, certification, and you will have to be within 100% conformity. So that's a tall order, and so you really need to buckle down. And you really need to 
uh, get very deep into those 110 controls and stay focused on those things. Um, I, we're, we're, going to, um, we're going to push out uh, the ass assessment guide hopefully by the end of September. And, but if you stay focused on the 110 controls for uh, the NIST 8171, the assessment guide will help refine the criteria for what success means. And that's very, very important. Um, and um, and it, it, will, it will help you sharpen the sword. But right now, um, uh, you know, pounding out the metal, if we can continue with that metaphor, pounding out the metal with the, the fire and the ice and the under the anvil, you need to you need to do that very hard work, very heavy lifting in order to, to uh, begin to shape that sword. All right. Um, yeah. Reagan, I couldn't agree more. Sure. And I know it's something that all of us tell our customers every day of, you know, CMMC is the future and it's coming on and you, you should be getting ready for it. But at the end of the day, the DFAR 7012. That's the clause that's in your contracts right now. That's what's requiring you to meet those 110 practices from the NIST 800-171. And that's really what you should be focusing on right now. It's almost a one-to-one -one mapping with CMMC level three, and it's gonna put you in a great spot no matter what. And with that, I kind of wanted to give it over to Nick and talk a little bit more about, you know, where should you be starting with this? How do you know what those 110 controls are? What are you meeting right now? What do you still have to meet? And let him kind of carry it on from there. All right, great. Uh, so really quick, uh, my name is Nick Delina, just a principal at, at DGC, one of the largest accounting tax and, and business advisory firms in the Northeast. Uh, we're an applicant C3 PAO for CMMC, uh, but I'm gonna talk about assessments in working towards CMMC. And I, I wanna start with just making a distinction. When I'm talking about assessments here, you know, today there are no C3 PAOs. So I'm talking about you know, just looking at your environment, preparing for CMMC, not talking about an assessment that a C3PAO would do at the point of certification. So I want to make that important distinction as, as we start. Um, next slide, Levi, please. Great. So um, one one quote I, I like is, is uh, by Peter Drucker, who's kind of the father of modern management science. Uh, he said, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And he was one of the early thinkers on putting some science around the idea of managing organizations you know, through the, the mid 20th century. And he was a big believer in establishing metrics and measuring uh, how organizations conduct what they do in order to establish baselines to improve. If you're not measuring it, how can you improve it? And so this is, Kind of a philosophy that I think applies to organizations as they prepare for uh, CMMC or are looking to meet the existing requirements and implement NIST 800-171. Next slide. So where where do you get started? Well, you know the chances are pretty good. You're you know if you're if you're here attending today that you're subject to NIST 800-171. You know you're interested in CMMC, but today you have these requirements in front of you. So the the important uh, place to start is to have a you know an honest conversation with yourself about where your compliance efforts stand today does your system security plan reflect your environment does it thoroughly document how you've implemented the requirements uh, i've seen you know many people use ssp templates which can be a great place to start but those are meant to be starting points and and not a quick you know check the box exercise if you think about a, a system security plan as uh, a standalone document that if handed off to a complete stranger ideally that that stranger having read through it end to end will have a very good understanding of your environment and not just the controls but you know demographically speaking what's the purpose of your platform what does it do who are the players? Are there different types of users? Are there multiple administrators? Do you delegate authority down to you know, lesser privileged super users? Uh, all the way through you know, hardware, software inventory, and then getting into the, the uh, security requirements themselves and how you've implemented them. It's not just, yes, we've implemented it. It's how did you do it? What are the specifics? And then likewise, for the POAM, are you, well, one, do you have a POEM, right? You should. Uh, are you making good progress on implementing the gaps that you have? 
are you tracking them? Have you established milestones for each of them? Are you working through those? Uh, or did you just do a cursory exercise, you know, when you first saw the 7012 clause? Uh, but it's it's having an honest conversation with yourself that you are making good progress, you know. Um, and and really kind of at the at the end of that, it's are you are, you know, are you adrift? Are you rudderless or are you making, you know, good good progress and, and you know achieving full implementation? Next slide. So really basically, I mean there's there's some types of assessments you can do. A self-assessment performed by you, assuming you know when I say you, I mean the the person responsible for compliance at your organization. Uh, that you know that is sort of the easiest way to go. It's not ideal uh, because you can you know if you're the one responsible for implementing these controls, it's very easy to get tunnel vision and go down a path where you maybe you've made some assumptions early on. Uh, and you're, you know, you've carried down the line, and maybe some of those assumptions were incorrect. So it's, I think it's ideal to involve others in your process. Another type of self-assessment uh, could be performed by another team member. So, you know, if you're responsible for compliance, involve someone else. Maybe it's somebody with a technical background, a compliance background, ideally, but someone else in your organization or another department. If you're big enough to have an internal audit team, those people are great too involved but you know many people in the dib you know are not at organizations that big but uh, usually just having this conversation with someone who can who can review what you're you're doing may point out some areas that you've missed uh, another type of assessment of course would be an independent third party bringing in somebody who's not affiliated with your organization who has a background in uh, helping other companies in the dib with NIST 800 171 and other frameworks that can often uh, be a good sanity check on some of the assumptions you've made, and you know you can leverage their expertise to help you along the way. Next slide. So, what should the assessments include? You know, you you want to look at the system security plan, you know, because that is really the the place where you're documenting the the progress that you've made. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier. It, it really isn't meant to be a binary exercise in the SSP. It's not meant to be a yes, no. You want to start with a organization-wide look. You know, the, the beginning sections of the system security plan should include demographics. Describe your company, describe what you do. Where does CUI live in the organization? Um, you know, what are the types of users you have? What are the uh, types of hardware you have, so on, the boundary of your uh, CUI. Have you enclaved CUI or is it, you know, the entire network in scope? We want to talk about those things to provide further clarity. Uh, you know, but the most important section of the system security plan uh, is the, the section where you describe how you've implemented the security requirements. So uh, you want to have absolutely the SSP be looked at as part of an assessment. Uh, and then you want to build further clarity around control gaps. Uh, so, in, in that, by that I mean, have an, a, an assessor look at all of the, you know, as we're talking about the standards today, look at 800-171 and assess whether your assumptions are correct. Have you truly implemented these controls? Maybe you've marked 30, 40 percent, 50 percent of them as implemented. Have the assessor verify that. Um, I've Often, uh, I came across a situation pretty recently, you know, we know the control uh, to control the use of mobile code in 171 and in CMMC. I was talking to somebody who thought that meant that they uh, couldn't use Android Studio and couldn't do mobile development in the environment and had to, you know, restrict the use of, uh, you know, Apple iOS development and Android development and had spent all this time working on MDM solutions and configuring, you know, blacklisting to, you know, prohibit this, and and they were months into this exercise. So it's very easy to to start off making assumptions, and you know, all of us come to the table with different levels of expertise uh, and different levels of understanding. So it's helpful to engage third parties just to confirm that. And then the the, uh, the compliant use of cloud service providers. So you know, in the DFARS clause, if you are using a cloud service provider to store processor transmit CUI, they have to have the security equivalent to FedRAMP moderate baseline. So this is another area I see overlooked uh, quite a bit. You want to be really careful about 
the third parties you're using for CUI. And it's very easy to overlook. Maybe you're using a backup solution that you installed years ago pre CUI, you know, before you even got into the space and now you're using CUI and that's getting pulled up and sent to a third party that is not, uh, does not have the security equivalent to Federal Modern Baseline. So and it's important to look at that. That's an amazing point, which I know Ryan's going to touch on a little more later on. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, and then lastly on this page, the, um, it, the cyber incident reporting capabilities are uh, often overlooked because they are not contained within 800-171, but if you look at the 7012 clause, sections C through G, there are very specific requirements for reporting cyber incidents as they impact CUI. So you wanna make sure that your organization is ready to go report that information within 72 hours of an incident. Uh, and you wanna have that assessor look at your ability to, uh, to stand that practice up. Next slide. I think that's it. All right, thank you very much. I'm gonna hand it over to Pat now. All right, awesome. Thanks so much, Nick. So I'm Patrick Colantonio. I'm the director of sales over at Nectar Labs and we're a software vendor that provides a seam a vulnerability scanner and some other tools uh, that are targeted towards trying to help small businesses address this problem and NIST 800-171 and now the CMMC. So I'm gonna be discussing uh, vendor and software considerations uh, for the CMMC. Next slide. So uh, basically, I'm just going to be setting the stage, uh, going, uh, trying not to get too deep uh, and, and buried in the vendors and software categories, discuss a little bit about implementation, configuration, and maintenance, and then wrap up with some additional considerations before I pass it off to Ryan. Uh, next slide. So uh, setting the stage, and, and Nick covered this in a, in a great way uh, previously. So it really comes down to one of the most important things is, of course, scope. And I know Ryan's going to touch upon this as well. And when you're evaluating solutions or, or vendors, it really comes down to where is your environment located? Is it on-premise? Is it hybrid? Is it purely cloud? Because there are different uh, vendors for each of those different considerations. And you obviously want the best one. You don't want an on-prem solution for a cloud environment because it's just not going to work. So that's a, a major uh, a major consideration. Centralization is also key. You want to make sure that as much as possible, you're looking at a single pane of glass. There's not a, if you have a fragmented uh, amount of, of software or fragmented insight into your environment, you're going to have fragmented compliance. Um, they just don't, it just doesn't work that way. So understanding scope and determining your, boundary, uh, your boundaries is going to be key to figuring out which equipment and personnel need to be protected. Uh, major gaps need to, need to come first, of course. There are some areas that are major, major holes and others that are more finesse, and, and we'll get into that. And it really comes down to, especially with NIST, as, as Regan said, uh, you shouldn't have any POEM items. It, you should be good. You should have a baseline right now. And and that's one of the biggest things of CMMC is having that continuous protection, monitoring, and ongoing maintenance. Uh, next slide. So uh, this doesn't include all of the different softwares uh, for consideration. Uh, there's mostly consists of major areas that uh, we especially see small business struggle with when it comes down to the um, the requirements of the compliance. And uh, first and foremost, after you determine scope and establish the boundaries of the environment, having a centralized uh, domain management and directory service is going to be crucial. Uh, it covers a, a wide swath of the of the compliance, whether it's the NIST or the CMMC. Uh, a lot of common ones out there are Microsoft uh, derived, whether it be Azure AD or, or Active Directory, but uh, there are other solutions, of course, but it's going to be a major uh, player in really just determining having a role-based access and asset management. The next area is having a, having a SIEM tool, security incident event management, and that is a crucial one to the areas of auditing and accountability, but also as uh, Nick was getting into, incident response 
and meeting both uh, the DFARS, the overarching DFARS, and the compliance requirements. Uh, so having that in place is key to identifying uh, suspicious activity or just making sure things are running smoothly for compliance. MFA gets a lot of attention uh, and it is important, but you can't have MFA if you don't have that first one, that uh, having a directory service. Um, Multi-factor is troublesome for most companies just because it's a lifestyle change. There's a lot that goes into the consideration of that, especially if it's a cloud-based, if it's on-prem. Um, we see a lot of difficulty having it be deployed on shop floors and manufacturers, for example. Um, so that's, that's definitely a big one. Endpoint protection, it's a very broad term and it does cover a lot of objectives and a lot of things if you uh, pick, the, pick the right one, it's the bottom line. Uh, endpoint protection can mean as little as antivirus, anti-malware, uh, things like that. But from a configuration management standpoint, whitelisting and blacklisting softwares, uh, hardwares, uh, also even managing encryption at, at the device level, having data loss prevention, assisting areas of media protection. Uh, your endpoint protection can really go up to bat for you if um, if it's the right if it's the right one and, and it covers a lot of a lot of objectives instead of again having a more fragmented approach vulnerability scanning and remediation is important to identify vulnerabilities that's an area that a lot of small businesses have have trouble with or need to procure a, a specialized tool set for and it's really a crucial to making sure that that good baseline is is maintained uh, backup utility is important and again going back to what when nick was talking about uh fed ramp considerations if you're just uh if you have a dr site or you're kicking it to uh, someplace that you own or or a localized data center okay sure but it comes down to are the uh, physical and encryption and personnel considerations uh, being implemented at that site and if it's going to the cloud somewhere it needs to be that that also comes under scope of uh, FedRAMP and encryption determinations. And uh, lastly, on the encryption side, having a next-gen firewall, and there's a lot of uh, companies that throw the term next-gen around. Next-gen uh, really truly means not just fire, uh, basic firewall uh, principles and, uh, and activities, but uh, IPS, IDS, um, really having a, a firm uh, a boundary protection which again is addressing a lot of controls, but also can tie into uh, email and spam and, and also a DNS filtering. Uh, so having a, a firewall, and one of the biggest things that comes up and is a major item of contention in the community is of course the wonderful and fabled FIPS encryption. Uh, having a FIPS validated module of which there are only a handful of firewall vendors that are able to meet that, especially when it comes to transmission of data especially when it comes to uh, VPN uh, connections and, and preventing split tunneling and, and a lot of those areas. So absolutely firewall is a, a real make it or break it area to consider. So when you get those tools uh, set up, uh, next slide please. Uh, configuration is, is absolutely crucial. You can buy the best tool ever and it can sit in a closet somewhere and it's not doing anything for you. So. Uh, making sure that it's configured, securely configured is important. Ongoing maintenance needs to be tracked and maintained and logged and of course, minimum uh, access, role-based access. So um, that only people who need to access that, uh, that asset, that software have access. Continuously reviewing just to make sure that uh, with updates to the softwares or, or the toolkits that you're using, uh, and any changes to the compliance are being consistently maintained and performed. So that review is important. Updates, updates, updates is, is super important for all operating systems in general, but also the softwares that you're using. Uh, there's a lot of softwares that will de uh, be deprecated or, or will sunset and they won't tell you. And then you'll go to log in and, and hey, this hasn't been supported or this hasn't been updated for the past 12 months. And that is going to be uh, at, at the worst to back door, um, you know, also uh, not as good as is kicking you out of compliance because of that. 
and of course monitoring uh, for making sure that there's successful outcomes, things are being performed appropriately, but also looking for suspicious activity. So a lot of that at stake and, and at play with um, evaluating vendors and tool sets. So on the last slide, um, uh, vendor considerations really comes down to, uh, which Ryan will get into new, of course, uh, having a managed service provider, MSSP, uh, just the ownership, the location, and when it comes down to CUI and ITAR restrictions and considerations, the citizenship of support, if you have a, you can have the best endpoint protection ever, but if their incident response team is uh, located in, in India and they're accessing systems that have CUI, that's, that's a breach. So those considerations do come into play, but then again, you can have the best software, but how long is it going to take to implement? How long is it going to take to maintain? And at the end of the day, do you have the right team in place internally? Do you need to augment that by having some outside expertise? You know, it's not going to be uh, Phil Swift slapping it on and saying it's good to go. Um, it might be something that you need to have fully managed externally and vendor, and as we've identified in the CMMC in this community, MSPs and MSSPs are uh, can be the make it or break it. Uh, it can be a major breach depending on the size of the MSP, how they do their business, how secure they are, and then their overall awareness of the compliance. So with that, I will leave it to Ryan to talk about those wonderful uh, things to consider. Thanks, Pat. I think if uh, one good way to to have a drinking game around CMMC might be to take a shot every time someone says FIPS. So I, I noted at, at least one opportunity there. Um, today I want to I really want to dish my my hot takes on CMMC. Uh, when Levi was putting together Levi and Power putting together this uh, idea for a webinar, they want to focus on practical steps and information that contractors could use. Obviously, there have been a lot of great informational sessions out there explaining what CMMC is uh, and, and the fact that it's coming, but a lot of us are, are ready to dig in and get some of this work done. So um, as I usually do, I overprepared or overestimated um, how much content I would need to prepare. So I may not be able to get through all of this, but if I go really fast, I'll, I'll just micro machines until uh, Levi pulls me off the stage. But I'd, I want to cover three Don't worry, key I'll areas. chime in if I need to. <laughs> please do, please do. Um, the first and, and biggest area that I want to harp on, because I think it's productive, hopefully, is to provide, um, from my perspective, a wake-up call to business leaders on the cost and effort required to achieve compliance. So that'll be the, the bulk of, of my contribution here today. But I also want to leave you with some strategies for compliance. Um, that, that one of my biggest compliance strategies is different ways that you can limit your scope so that you're not uh, applying cost and complexity to uh, more systems than you need to. And then finally, if we have time, I do want to talk about considerations for companies that are using third-party service providers for IT or security. So here's the big one for most businesses that I talk to. Everyone wants to know, obviously, how much is this going to cost? to prepare for CMMC and what they should budget. Um, this is a totally understandable question, but also fundamentally flawed. Uh, and I think many businesses in the defense industrial base would not like the answer that, that I would give anyways, but let's dive into it because it's the number one thing that I hear. Um, first of all, talking about assumptions, right? So if you were doing all the things that you said you have been doing under DFAR 7012, uh, CMMC may not be a massive lift for you. But we know uh, through the result of market research and even uh, the DOD inspector general has put out a report that most of the defense industrial base is not super far along in their NIST 800-171 implementation. So with that as context, most of the companies that I talk to really need a fundamental mindset change around cybersecurity. And the first thing to realize is that IT and cybersecurity are different disciplines. So your IT team, with of course some exceptions, um, if they, they don't have a dedicated security professional on the team, they may not be your best resource to lead your security efforts. And likewise, understanding the nuances of compliance requirements and DOD security requirements is a whole thing unto itself. And most of your general IT and security practitioners out there don't have this close familiarity with the requirements. So just bear that in mind. 
So if you're talking about cost, um, let's talk about the required skills that you're going to need. Because remember, this is a people and process thing as much as it is a technology thing, and tools alone are not going to solve your, your problem, right? So um, we at, at Steelroot, we took some time, we looked at NIST's NICE framework, N-I-C-E, which defines roles based on knowledge, skills, and abilities. And we tried to distill it down to what are the core skills that you need to implement and maintain a DFAR 7012 compliant IT infrastructure. And we boiled it down to, to four different skills. Uh, I'm not gonna go into it here, just in the interest of time, but the associated annual salary costs of adding those skills to payroll are anywhere between $300,000 and $500,000. Um, I know where I live in Boston, it would probably be towards the higher end. So there, there's just one starting point for you, but I, I think it's a useful starting point because the fundamental mindset shift that needs to happen today is that, as Nick was saying, security is not a check the box activity, and this is not a bolt on to your IT department. Today, cybersecurity is really a critical business function, and I think it's helpful to think about it like HR or finance or some capability that every business needs to operate in today's economy, especially if your business involves handling the government sensitive information. But until that mindset shift happens and companies can start building cybersecurity maturity, they're gonna to struggle to make that internal culture change that security really requires. But the next question is, of course, what are my capital expenses going to be? What's the stuff that I need to buy? What do I have to configure to implement the CMMC practices? Um, and again, this is a, a, a wildly sliding scale depending on your business, the size, complexity of, of what it is that you do. Um, but again, assuming that most companies have not implemented all 110 security requirements in NIST 800-171, I think a lot of companies would be better served in a sense, and I want to choose my words carefully here, starting over and coming to terms with a system boundary that really makes sense before they can be uh, prepared for a CMMC assessment. So as a service provider myself, I'm often asked to show this all-in cost. Uh, what's it going to cost to be compliant, assuming a CMMC maturity level of, of level three? Uh, but not only is this an impossible task, it also misses that fundamental mindset shift that cybersecurity is not a project. It's an ongoing capability that's going to take time. But everyone wants numbers, so here's what I throw out there. I say you're looking at 200 to 500 hours of labor minimum, and that's you know hands-on planning, configuration, deployment, implementation, process development, documentation. Um, depending on the complexity of your, your environment, that range might be radically underscoped, but for a lot of the small businesses that, that we work with, I feel like that's uh, pretty spot on. Then you've got your hardware purchases, say for example, like, like Pat said, if, if your existing firewall or VPN appliance doesn't support FIPS cryptography, you might have to buy something else. You may have software purchases, for example, if you don't have a vulnerability scanning capability or log collection capability, and then the certification uh, assessment's gonna cost you some money too. But but the biggest takeaway here that I'd like to leave everyone with is that there's going to be ongoing costs for the proper care and feeding of your cybersecurity and compliance programs, right? Um, someone used this analogy before. Actually, I think it was, was you, Pat. Uh, you told me once that compliance is like having a baby. And I liked that. Because, you know, your responsibilities don't end when you when you have the child. They actually are just getting started, right? So you could have spent all this preparation time building the nursery and getting all the, the baby swag that you need, but um, that's really just the beginning. You never actually stop being a parent with those responsibilities and compliance is the same thing. Next slide, please. So my takeaway here is, is basically beware of any solution that is advertising getting you compliant quickly. Um, I've actually seen marketing in this, these kind of early days of CMMC that says, hey, we'll get you CMMC compliant in 14 days or whatever. Um, do I believe you can set up a remote desktop environment in a couple of weeks? Sure, but you know, CM and CMMC stands for cybersecurity maturity. And that's not just technology, it's it just as much about people and process. So um, anyone preparing for CMMC, take a really hard look at those process maturity requirements. And at level three, you know, you'd better have something more substantive than a stack of IT policy templates that you customized, right? So um, again, huge takeaway here, don't forget that your cybersecurity program under CMMC has to be, quote, adequately resourced 
at level three, which is including people, processes, and the technology that we've been talking about. Next slide. I know I'm gonna run out of time here very quickly. So um, real quick, number one thing you need to do to get started, start by defining a system boundary. It has an enormous impact on how much money and time you're gonna spend on achieving compliance. It cannot be understated. Um, the diagram on this page is complex. It just represents different ways in which information systems and uh, authorized parties can interact with CUI or FCI on your network. Uh, this, is, this comes from a free resource from Compliance Forge, which I linked at the bottom here. I know Levi will circulate the slides. You could, you could dig in there. And then Levi, if you could just click for my, my cool little animation here. Thank you. Um, of course, this is all way easier said than done, right? Because one of the fundamental problems that a lot of contractors have is, what is CUI on my system? Um, and that is a question that I cannot answer for you succinctly. Um, but I think that a lot of organizations have kind of said, to hell with this whole scoping exercise. I don't know what CUI is because my prime or the government is not labeling it for me. So I'm just going to protect everything as if it is CUI, which isn't always a bad strategy. It just drastically increases what you have to spend or do if your system boundaries your whole company. So I know I'm out of time and I want to leave time for questions here. Um, I did put some more information and links in these, these slides. Uh, I did want to talk about third-party providers too. Um, I, I did a, a, an event last week that goes into more detail there, and I think we could probably share that content if, if anyone is interested. But in the interest of getting to folks' questions, um, why don't I end it there? All right, awesome, great job, guys. And I know as you guys have been slowly working through this, we've had a lot of amazing questions um, some really nice comments as well. I know we seem to have another Patriots fan out there, so appreciate that. I know most of the panelists um, outside of Reagan are actually New England residents, so it's going to be a long year without Brady, but we should be able to do this. Uh, first question that we have up is actually for Reagan, and I, I know this is something that Katie gets asked a lot, but what would you say to companies that don't believe that this is going to be implemented in the way that it is? Um, lots of smalls have heard this story before with new certifications. I know they heard it with DFAR 7012 and CMMC. How did they know that they actually need to do this? Yeah, so um, huh. that it's a fair question. I mean, number one, uh, number one, I, 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 I really hear that both from the client side um, and also, uh, you know, just about every webinar. And so, you know, I'm a pretty transparent uh, guy. I think you you guys know me, and if you you follow me on LinkedIn, and of course our conversations over the last year, I, I try to be as as very candid as possible, right? Because, um, you know, um, dressing up, you know, dressing up the ugly baby does doesn't help um, people uh, legitimately get ready and get prepared, right? And that that's really fundamentally my job. Um, so. I think the the answer is is, is number one is yeah I, I just harken back to harken back to the 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 GO, GAO has pointed out that that the DOD has tried to do this five times previously internally and failed okay uh, DFARS took seven years to transition from uh, its beginning unto the rule now look at the speed and the and the and the lightning progression that we stand with uh, the transition from DFARS to 7012. Then the last couple of years, um, CMMC has, has stood up, rolled out, and we are moving out. Now, there are, all, there are lessons so with speed. It, it is difficult, right? It is going to be refined, and it should be refined, right? So this isn't perfect, that's for sure. And, but, um, um, and it, this isn't easy, and I can, I can personally testify to you to that, uh, looking at from the strategic perspective, and also, looking down um you know being in the trenches with with companies all over the united states and and in the world for that matter with clients so I, I i totally get that but the reality is is that this is a, a, an absolute need that everyone recognizes and there is no plan b so uh, you know 600 billion dollars in loss that is our future that is our next generation warfighting capability that is those are jobs for real americans those are those are risk factors for real companies right now. It's happening right now as we speak. That's not hyperbole. That's reality. And so, uh, uh, what I would say to you is this: is that embracing this is is patriotism. 
embracing this is national security. Now, what we have to do is we have to uh, and it, it, uh, embracing embracing this is is the security of our future and the security of our present. That that's not hyperbole. Um, so the question is is how do we do it? Not if we're going to do it. So we want to do it smartly. We want to do it. We want to simplify and bring clarity to what we need to do, which all of the panelists have, have done a great job sort of identifying the steps that you need to take right now. And then and then we need to do this uh, and then we need that feedback. Right. Um, we need that. The, the purpose of the CMMC accreditation body is to stand in the gap. It's that is to manage the tension between the national security interests with the DOD and and in and, and the in and the business interest of the dib that is our job so we need that um, we need that feedback um, both positive and negative we need the criticism and we need the praise to know what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong and so uh, when there's um, miscommunication and misunderstanding on and as we continue to roll forward we need that feedback because we're going to drive to clarity we're going to drive to consistency and we're going to drive to sustainability uh, that is the fundamental purpose of what we're doing, and so you know, um, I, I, I take I take the hesitation, I take the skepticism and the cynicism um, very seriously, and it's warranted. Uh, look look at the, cr the crazy world w that we've endured uh, in the la in 2020. So um, just uh, you know, uh, uh, be um, be skeptical, but be but prepare because. It generally, as many as many have pointed out, generally it takes a, an organization about six to twelve months, sometimes eighteen months. Uh, most of, most of my clients in the past have come to us eighteen months after spinning their wheels in the mud and making little or no progress. So it's very important that when you think about uh, what the future holds for us, is to backwards plan right now and to have gotten started. If you if you if you need to dust off your poem, you need to mobilize both your IT people and your business people. Uh, because the IT people cannot get this done. The, they, uh, the data, the data and the requirements follow the data wherever the data goes in your workflow, in your on your manufacturing floor, uh, uh, person to person, right? So you need to get those stakeholders, those program managers, your operations people, your um, quality people, uh, your production people. Those are all the stakeholders that are vitally important in order for um, in order for to you for you to align your organization and meet the requirements um, and start today, tomorrow, Monday, right now. So um, it's it's okay to be skeptical. I, I get that, um, and, and you should be. And it's not going to look the same tomorrow that it is, does today, nor it should be. But what I'm telling you is, is that this train is coming and, and, and it needs to come. And, and I know it's difficult. I know this is hard. I, I, I do. And I know it's costly, but it has to be done. Yeah, that's a great answer. And uh, I, I know this is another really good question that came in. I'm going to shoot this one over to Ryan. But what recommendations do you have specifically for manufacturers that are working really hard to become compliant? Unfortunately, their customers continue to send them their CUI data through unsecure methods, aka regular good old email. That's a, a classic question. Um, just real quick before answering that, I just want to piggyback on, on what was just said. And for all the, the critics out there, let's not forget, you know, even if CMMC fell flat on its face, which it's definitely not going to, you still have the DFAR 7012 requirement in your contracts. So Reagan was right to, to focus on that in his opening remarks. Like, forget about CMMC right now. If you want to get caught up in the technicalities and the rollout, um, you know, go, go spin yourself into a corner. But Meanwhile, you have that requirement in your contracts to protect this information. That's not going away. Um, to the manufacturer or any company whose uh, whose customers, whose primes, whose agency contacts are sending them uh, CUI through unsecured methods, I mean, you have responsibility for the information when it's when it's in your care, right? So you need to set up a way that your your customers can get information to you, such that when you receive it you are handling it in a compliant way. Um, you know, it, th this is a fundamental problem of, of you don't, you can't control what people are sending you. There are some sophisticated ways that I have seen organizations try to uh, have a compensating control for this. So just one example, and I'm not necessarily recommending this for anyone, but just to answer the question, 
let's say your, your strategy is, we're gonna set up this compliant enclave for CUI, and we're gonna tell all of our uh, customers, suppliers, whoever, that if you're sending us sensitive information, it goes to this address, right? Don't send it to my regular corporate email address. Um, there are ways to put in place some compensating controls such that if someone does send you CUI to the wrong address, you can set up, for example, exchange mail flow rules or something like that to redirect it to your enclave before it ever hits your, your unsecure environment. Again, I'm not su suggesting that, um, but that these are the types of considerations that, that um, come out when you do that business process CUI flow mapping exercise, which should be at the top of the list for anyone really getting serious about defining a system boundary. Uh, and that is sitting down with your stakeholders. So if, if you're a, a, let's say a build to spec manufacturer, right? Your CUI flow might look something like this. You, you win the business, your business development team receives a drawing or a set of specs from a prime. Uh, that information gets passed to a project manager who sh shares it with engineering. At some point, that information might get sent back to the customer, and eventually some form of this information is passed to the shop floor into quality. Understanding all those stakeholders and what form CUI takes as it flows throughout your business process is critical. Um, I didn't get to it in my slides, but one thing I'm super interested in right now is this, this idea of redacting or downgrading CUI. Um, uh, the, the, the CMMC office at DOD has called this disaggregation. I included a quote there in the slides that we'll, we'll pass around. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't tell you exactly how you do this, but I do know uh, that it, it should be possible in some cases, and maybe especially for manufacturers, to take out some critical pieces of information in, say, a drawing about um, the DOD application, uh, right, or other factors that, that you can kind of uh, decontextualize the specs of whatever it is that you're building, and then maybe it's not CUI anymore. Uh, that was a bit of a tangent, but <laughs> hopefully yeah, no, that it was it was a good answer though. So I think that really answered the question really well. And I think this next question, I know it's one I've heard had a few times, and I'm gonna Ryan or Pat, whichever one of you wants to take it. But it's what are your thoughts on ensuring compliance with all operating systems? The specific example is they have a very heavy amount of users currently on Windows, but they're finding difficulties to standardize that same security control across both Linux and Mac. And I know it's something Pat and I see all the time where you'll usually have one C-suite executive who refuses to get off of their MacBook while the rest of the company is predominantly Windows. So what do you guys recommend as far as, is it worth implementing a wider range of tools to keep it going or is it better to possibly go all Windows? Um, I'll answer that and then I'll let uh, Brian uh, come in because we both have different experiences. And I also want to just tack on a, Ryan's answer. It really comes down to, uh, you need to, worry about what you can control you know things outside of your control that's you know make sure you're you're good and then you can point to your policies and your procedures and say listen we we did what we needed to um to, to kind of answer that but from a obviously uniformity amongst your in centralization amongst your rollout is going to make life a lot easier but life isn't easy and especially when it comes to um, small business and, and, and especially manufacturers, there's a lot of end of life systems. There's a lot of deprecated systems that need to be air gapped. Um, so, I mean, with the answer of Linux and Mac, I, uh, obviously, if you can consolidate to a singular OS, uh, uh, with especially with Windows, it's it's easier to get compliant. Uh, it's still pretty hard, but it's easier to get compliant than say Linux or Mac. Um, if you need those applications, obviously you need to um, secure them as best as you can and either have all alternate uh, alternative methods of, of securing or or uh, trying your best but i i know that ryan has more experience with that uh, specifically um but it definitely obviously uniformity is 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 key and, and is crucial uh, to have a uh, easier way to get compliant yeah, and I'd be interested in Nick's opinion on that too from an, uh, an auditor's perspective. I'll just say, this is again, just my personal opinion. Um, when we started working with customers a few years ago on implementing NIST 800-171 requirements, it looked a lot different because we had this idea of, oh, anything we can't solve right away, we're gonna stick in our POAM document and deal with it later. Um, now that we've got this kind of pass-fail-ish mentality to CMMC, um, I'm taking a harder line with customers and saying, 
I know that I can build you an, an assessment defensible system using the Microsoft environment. Um, if you absolutely require Mac, just know that you are uh, doubling your scope in terms of the, the tool sets that you may need to acquire and the processes that you may need to manage. Uh, so I, I've gone as far as telling customers that um, when it comes time for assessment, we're not going to have any any Macs in your system boundary. I know that's a non-starter for some organizations, but that's that's the the tack I've been taking. But Nick, anything to add there? Yeah, I would echo that. You know, I think if you look, especially at smaller companies, if you're 75% Windows based, and you've got those executives that like their MacBook Airs and so on, and hey, I'm a Mac guy. You know, I think there's one over my shoulder here that you might be able to see. Uh, but just in in the context of 800, 171, and CMMC, unless you're a big organization with deep pockets, you're talking about standing up a parallel infrastructure just to manage these Macs. And, uh, you know, as Ryan mentioned, you're just in increasing your scope. You know, oftentimes it's very expensive uh, and, you know, you need to enforce the equivalent solutions in a totally different environment. So I think once, you, to, in my experience, is probably similar to these guys, but once you bring that up and uh, and kind of, you know, paint that picture usually the uh, the executive with the macbook air is is willing to swap it out with a you know an equivalent pc that's uh you know it'll be light and easy to carry around yeah no that's that's an awesome answer and i know that's what we recommend as well it's just it's going to come down to cost and make it a little easier for you guys um really good question over here that i know especially patrick and i probably don't get a lot um Ryan, Nick, whichever one of you wants to grab this one, but addressing legacy OT systems that are way out of date, both on the traditional OT side and on the integrated PC hardware. If they're processing CUI in the form of a program that's necessary for business, say manufacturing, for example, what can you do? I was uh, just speaking to, to someone at DHS the other day, talking about how they're eyeing the CMMC rollout uh, that's happening for DOD. And I asked the question, you know, given all the critical infrastructure stuff that DHS deals with, if they were to adopt CMMC in the future, would they need some sort of OT overlay for CMMC? Um, and that's the best answer I have right now is I think that CMMC as it's written today doesn't fully contemplate those use cases. Um, certainly a lot of the practices do apply to OT, but there are some special considerations there too. So. Um, from my perspective, jury's still out on that. Yeah, I think just some practical considerations. You know, unfortunately, we still see Windows XP out there, and I've I've seen older systems out there, and it's just circumstance and supporting products that you know that maybe go back 20 years. You know, and there there's some practical things you can do. Obviously, air gapping is ideal, uh, and in some cases that's not possible. But uh, you know, in those cases, you can try your best to firewall those systems off completely. Don't allow, especially with XP, don't allow internet browsing. You don't want somebody pulling up Internet Explorer 6.0 and surfing the web. Uh, so, you know, there, there are things you can do to sort of limit the damage and, and you know, almost do an enclave within an enclave to, uh, to containerize that. But I think, it, you know, the best thing to do is just invest a little bit of money in eliminating that technical debt and see if you can advance that platform to a supported operating system. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I know this is a question that's actually really interesting, and I don't think I've ever thought of before, but for Reagan specifically, or if anyone else wants to chime in, would there be any type of event that would trigger a CMMC already certified company to possibly need recertification? And if so, what would it possibly be? So uh, that's a that's a great question. Um, let me let me hang fire just for a second. I want to piggyback on what Ryan said earlier in that focusing on DFARS 7012 is a necessity because people like um, uh, the Navy and the other military services have aggressively stepped up their enforcement of DFAR, DFAR 7012. And you are going to see DCMA and DC, DCSA investigations um, begin rolling out on uh, False Claims Act and self-attestation that's not accurate. So I, I just wanted to emphasize that point. Um, it, it's happening now, that, that ag aggressive enforcement is happening now because DOD is serious about this issue 
And, and quite frankly, I, I've actually been contacted two times this week by, organ, uh, by organizations who've had um, uh, CMC level four already inserted into their contracts, uh, that requirement, right? So, um, you know, they're gonna get that rolled back because there is no, there is no substantiating clause right now, but that, um, that, that should illustrate how, how many organizations are out there biting at the bullet to get this done. So um, I think that uh, a recertification is, uh, so recertification, there, there are a couple challenges here and everything that I say is, um, everything I say is purely speculative. Although we've, we're obviously working on this, but there's no policy guidance been given out uh, to us in, in the, this direction. So um, what you're, uh, I, 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 I take risk for everyone to have a, some clarity about understanding about this is a work in progress. However, um, what there, there, are, there are some, some difficulties that, that organizations may face. So it's possible, it's possible for a contracting officer to ask for recertification. If they believe there's an incident or they believe they have some suspicion that um, an organization is not following requirements, I, that, that could be possible. Uh, again, there's no policy to, to substantiate that, but it, it, it assumes um, that that recertification would be the easiest route or on um, them their, their request to DIPCAC to validate the certification. Also, there's another piece on the QAQC piece, which could also involve us and also involve DIPCAC as well, where you have an organization, they've been certified, they um, um, and uh, the quality uh, quality assurance and quality control process within our organization, uh, CMMCAB, uh, is it is necessary because we want it to be as consistent as possible uh, from organization to organization. So we need to make sure is that assessors are assessing that standard con as consistently as possible. So I personally and, and Jeff Dalton have asked for a very robust QC program to ensure that C3POs and assessors are hitting the mark on 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 uh, um, on the application of the assessment criteria. Uh, uh, you know, uh, practice by practice and organization by uh, organization. The reason for that is because that's in everyone's best interest. We want to make sure that um, that uh, there inevitably will be challenges. Of course, there will be. But what we want to do is we want to make sure uh, fairness. I don't use the word fair very often, but so what I'll say is consistent. We need the consistent application of the practices across the DIB because we do not want to create. Uh, we want to. We want to create competitive differentiation in those organizations who are doing a great job. What we don't want to do is, is create um, uh, um, um, unfair competitive advantage because of the fact that there's inconsistency in the standard, right, and the application of the standard. So you, you can expect organizations that, to be revisited time to time, either by um, the, our QC program or by uh, DIPCAC, um, the DCMA program, uh, to, to be able to ensure, again, that the consistency, that the standard is being upheld and that the, uh, this, uh, the standard was applied consistently. There also, we've also uh, uh, um, discussed about, uh, though an organization may, may require a, um, a, it is required to complete the program 100%, what about an organization who's making changes, who needs to go onto their POEM for, you know, um, uh, the various things that that organizations just need to do right upgrades and and technology changes and those sorts of things and so they're going to implement um, uh, compensating controls to in order to adjust in order to to maintain security of course and then the, but those compensating controls may not be a one-to-one -one consistency with uh with the practices right so um how um how does the organization um capture that Inside of there, you know, the update of the SSP would be required. Configuration management, right, um, would be uh, required, and, and and risk assessment would be required. So, how to remember that underneath the configuration management requirements, I have to assess. Um, I'm going to make changes. How do those changes um, assess my security posture, and how do they assess my overall risk of the organization? So, we would need to do, uh, um, uh, document those those changes that would affect their their security status. And impact um, impact their their current um, sustainment of of certification, and then uh, we would want to be able to um, uh, report that in some manner. In, in the ITAR world, it's called a voluntary disclosure, where where I'm voluntarily disclosing the fact that I have not been compliant, but I have a path 
uh, to get to, to either um, compensate or, or to or to do corrective action in order to to um, to, to become uh, in alignment with compliance. So th those details aren't worked out, but you can you can use other major data man um, um, uh, um, uh, data compliance regimes like ITAR as a as a reference because it makes sense. Um, so um, and if you have ITAR data. That's you know you're 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 going to have to execute that uh, those responsibilities uh, for um, the ITAR process anyway. All right, awesome. So I know we went a few minutes over. Uh, we still have a whole lot of questions to get to. I'm going to divvy them up between all the different panelists. Make sure that we get answers out. I also just want to let everyone know that we will be shooting out the slide deck along with a recording of the webinar as soon as we possibly have it, and that way you know you can go back, look it over, and give it a look. I just want to take a second thank all of our panelists, Ryan, Patrick, Reagan, Nick, for a great job and everyone for coming and joining us on this Friday afternoon. And uh, I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day and have a great weekend. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.